Chapter 24. Well said, old mole, canst thou work I, the ground so fast? Dot. By the next day we had forgotten all our sufferings. At first, I was wondering that I was no longer thirsty, and I was for asking for the reason. The answer came in the murmuring of the stream at my feet. We breakfasted, and drank of this excellent calibiate water. I felt wonderfully stronger, and quite decided upon pushing on. Why should not so firmly convinced a man as my uncle furnish with so industrious a guide as hands, and accompanied by so determined a nephew as myself, go on to final success? Such were the magnificent plans which struggled for mastery within me. If it had been proposed to me to return to the summit of Snaefell, I should have indignantly declined. Most fortunately, all we had to do was to descend. Let us start, I cried, awakening by my shouts the echoes of their vaulted hollows of the earth. On Thursday, at 8 a.m., we started afresh, the granite tunnel winding from side to side, earned us past unexpected turns, and seemed almost to form a labyrinth. But, on the whole, its direction seemed to be south, easterly. My uncle never ceased to consult his compass to keep account of the ground gone over. The gallery dipped down a very little way from the horizontal scarcely more than two inches in a fathom, and the stream ran gently, murmuring at our feet. I compared it to a friendly genius guiding us underground, and caressed with my hand the soft naiad, whose comforting voice accompanied our steps. With my reviving spirits, these mythological notions seemed to come unbidden. As for my uncle, he was beginning to storm against the horizontal road. He loved nothing better than a vertical path. But this way seemed indefinitely prolonged, and instead of sliding along the hypotenuse as we were now doing, he would willingly have dropped down the terrestrial radius, but there was no help for it. And as long as we were approaching the center at all we felt that we must not complain. From time to time, a steeper path appeared. Our naiad then began to tumble before us with a hoarser murmur, and we went down with her to a greater depth. On the whole, that day and the next we made considerable way, horizontally, very little vertically. On Friday evening, the 10th of July, according to our calculations, we were 30 leagues south, east of Rijkiavik, and at a depth of two leagues and a half. At our feet there now opened a frightful abyss. My uncle, however, was not to be daunted, and he clapped his hands at the steepness of the descent. This will take us a long way, he cried, and without much difficulty, for the projections in the rock form quite a staircase. The ropes were so fastened by hands as to guard against accident. And the descent commenced. I can hardly call it perilous, for I was beginning to be familiar with this kind of exercise. This well, or abyss, was a narrow cleft in the mass of the granite, called by geologists a fault, and caused by the unequal cooling of the globe of the earth. If it had at one time been a passage for eruptive matter thrown out by Snaefell, I still could not understand why no trace was left of its passage. We kept going down a kind of winding staircase, which seemed almost to have been made by the hand of man. Every quarter of an hour we were obliged to halt, to take a little necessary repose and restore the action of our limbs. We then sat down upon a fragment of rock, and we talked as we ate and drank from the stream. Of course, down this fault the hands back fell in a cascade, and lost some of its volume, but there was enough in to spare to slay car. Thirst, besides, when the incline became more gentle, it would of course resume its peaceable course. 
At this moment it reminded me of my worthy uncle, in his frequent fits of impatience and anger, while below it ran with the calmness of the Icelandic hunter. On the 6th and 7th of July we kept following the spiral curves of this singular well, penetrating an actual distance no more than two leagues, but being carried to a depth of five leagues below the level of the sea. But on the 8th, about noon, the fault took, towards the south, east, a much gentler slope, one of about 45 degrees. Then the road became monotonously easy. It could not be otherwise for there was no landscape to vary the stages of our journey. On Wednesday, the 15th, we were seven leagues underground, and had traveled 50 leagues away from Snaefell. Although we were tired, our health was perfect, and the medicine chest had not yet had occasion to be opened. My uncle noted every hour the indications of the compass, the chronometer, the aneroid and the thermometer, the very same which he has published in his scientific report of our journey. It was, therefore, not difficult to know exactly our whereabouts. When he told me that we had gone fifty leagues horizontally, I could not repress an exclamation of astonishment at the thought that we had now long left Iceland behind us. What is the matter? he cried. I was reflecting that if your calculations are correct we are no longer under Iceland. Do you think so? I am not mistaken, I said, and examining the map, I added, we have passed Cape Portland, and those fifty leagues bring us under the wide expanse of ocean, under the sea, my uncle repeated, rubbing his hands with delight. Can it be? I said is the ocean spread above our heads? Of course, Axel, what can be more natural? At Newcastle are there, not coal mines extending far under the sea. It was all very well for the professor to call this so simple. But I, could not feel quite easy at the thought that the boundless ocean was rolling over my head, and yet it really mattered very little whether it was the plains and mountains that covered our heads or the Atlantic waves, as long as we were arched over by solid granite. And, besides, I was getting used to this idea, for the tunnel, now running, straight, now winding as capriciously in its inclines as in its turnings, but constantly preserving its south, easterly direction, and, always running deeper, was gradually carrying us to very great depths. Indeed, Four days later, Saturday, the 18th of July, in the evening, we arrived at a kind of vast grotto, and here my uncle paid Hans his weekly wages, and it was settled that the next day, Sunday, should be a day of rest.